think everybody is here. Um, calling the final case for today, which is a full 30 minute grant with some additional um, argument from Amiki, um, Council of Organizations and Others for Education about Parochioid versus the state of Michigan. Let me just run down the way the arguments will go, the order and timing. Mr. DeRosier, you'll start. You have 30 minutes, you can try and reserve some of that um, for rebuttal. Mr. Rastusha, you'll go next, you also have 30 minutes. Ms. Sherman, you'll follow with five minutes. Mr. Wolf, after Ms. Sherman with 10 minutes, and then Mr. Bursch with 15. Um, and then we'll go back to Mr. DeRosier if he has, if he has successfully uh, held on to any of his minutes. Um, I don't see anybody worried that I said anything incorrectly. So why don't we get started with Mr. DeRosier. <clears throat> Thank you, Chief Justice McCormick. Good afternoon, may it please the court. Philip DeRosier appearing on behalf of the plaintiffs. I'd like to please reserve seven minutes for rebuttal if I could. Section 152B is unconstitutional because it violates the plain text of Article 8, Section 2. Article 8, Section 2 provides that no public money shall be appropriated or paid to aid or maintain a non-public school or to support the employment of any person at a non-public school. In other words, Article 8, Section 2 expressly prohibits the direct payment of public funds to non-public schools. Yet that's exactly what Section 152B does. It directly reimburses non-public schools for the costs they incur in complying with various state mandates, and it does so in the form of wage reimbursement. For that simple reason, Section 152B is unconstitutional. The Court of Appeals majority said that it might agree with this analysis if it weren't for this court's decisions in Traverse City School District and advisory opinion. But we think the majority misinterpreted those decisions. First of all, neither decision can properly be read in a manner that's inconsistent with Article 8, Section 2's text. If that provision means anything, it's that no funds can be paid directly to non-public schools. And despite what the Court of Appeals majority held and what several amici argue in their briefs, the court didn't say that direct funding is okay so long as it's for health, safety, and welfare purposes and not education. All the court did in Traverse City School District was recognize that providing certain publicly funded services is permissible so long as control remains with public authorities such that any benefit to the non-public school is incidental. That's why shared time instruction and auxiliary services are okay. They don't involve direct payments to non-public schools and the employees providing the services are controlled by public authorities. The other key difference is that shared time instruction and auxiliary services are provided to students, not the schools themselves, and are only useful to an otherwise viable school. That's what makes them incidental, as opposed to, in the words of advisory opinion, a primary and essential element of a private school's existence. By contrast, the funds appropriated under Section 152B would flow directly to the non-public schools and be within their control. In addition, the funds provide primary support because the mandates under Section 152B must be complied with in order for a school to exist. So whether you look at the plain text of Article 8, Section 2, or through the lens of Traverse City School District and advisory opinion, this is precisely what that pr provision forbids. The only possible exception, and the, uh, the state discusses this in its brief, is for transportation related funding. As of course, Article 8, Section 2 states that the legislature may provide for the transportation of students to and from any non-public school. But Section 152B must still be invalidated in its entirety because it's not possible for the court to determine whether the legislature would have enacted Section 152B or made the appropriate, uh, excuse me, the appropriation it did had it known that transportation uh, related costs were the only costs that could be properly reimbursed under Article 8, Section 2. Finally, invalidating Section 152B would not violate the Free Exercise Clause. As the Supreme Court recently explained in its Espinoza decision, the Free Exercise Clause prohibits unequal treatment of religion, and it protects against laws that discriminate on the basis of religious status. But those restrictions are not implicated here because Article 8, Section 2 applies equally to all non-public schools without regard to their religious nature. It is completely neutral when it comes to religion. In fact, this court already recognized as much in advisory opinion, where the court observed that Proposal C does not speak of religion, but of non-public schools. 
And while Amiki seek to challenge Article 8, Section 2 as a so-called Blaine Amendment, that effort should be rejected for a number of reasons. First of all, true Blaine Amendments explicitly discriminate on the basis of religion. Article 8, Section 2 does not. It prohibits funding of all non-public schools, not just religious schools. Second, it would be improper to speculate about what motivated the 1.4 million voters who approved Proposal C some 50 years ago. Third, Article 8, Section 2 was reauthorized in 2000. More than 4 million votes were cast that year, with nearly 70% of voters in favor of maintaining Article 8, Section 2 in its current state. Finally, the reality is, is that this issue was not litigated in the Court of Claims, so there is no record. So that makes, in our view, this case an inappropriate vehicle for considering subjective motivation, even if it were appropriate to do so. For these reasons, we think that the court should decline Amiki's invitation to go beyond the plain text of Article 8, Section 2. And because the Court of Claims properly found Section 152B to violate that plain text, we ask that the Court of Appeals' contrary decision be reversed. And with that, I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. DeRozier. I'm, I'm going to start with uh, Justice Kavanaugh. Thanks. Uh, Mr. DeRozier, um, I guess sort of to the, to the last point about the um, discriminatory intent not being litigated in the Court of Appeals. Is that is that what would distinguish um, or perhaps caution against Amiki's reliance on the on the Lucchini case, where there was, I believe, that was based on a nine-day trial in determining what the intent of the amendment was. Yes, I think that's exactly right. We have no record here whatsoever because um, this issue was was never. Uh, litigated in the lower court. And the other thing I think is, as I mentioned, uh, a decision like Lukimi is, is distinguishable, I think, because you, know, you, you have certain, certain instances where subjective motivation, um, I, I think the Supreme Court's precedents are at best uh, confused. But I think that in a situation like this, where you have a voter-initiated referendum, um, under the Supreme Court's precedents, the only way that you can ever look at subjective motivation is if it's abundantly clear based on a record that the only explanation um, for the provision is some kind of discriminatory purpose or, and, and that there was some kind of discriminatory intent involved. And so particularly in a case like this where there is no record, I, I think you're exactly right that that's what distinguishes uh, our case from, from many of the cases that the amici discuss. And am I correct in understanding that, that, that there isn't, uh, that the parties aren't advocating for a remand for that type of hearing? I mean, so so even if that would be a sufficient process by which perhaps that might be determined, putting that aside, if if that's not what's being advocated for here, I, or I guess I, I just want to, to confirm that my understanding is that, that it's not being advocated. It is not, no, you're absolutely correct. Okay, thank you. Justice Markman. No questions, thank you. Justice Zara. Thank you. Um, following up on the question just asked by Justice Kavanaugh, um, I have a concern. Do, is, is this case a genuine controversy susceptible to, to resolution by judicial review in as much as the parties here seem to be in agreement on everything? between your, your client and the state defendants? Um, well, Justice Sara, I think that, that's a good question. I mean, clearly this is not the typical case. Um, however, I do think there, uh, at, the, at the beginning of the case, which I think is where the proper focus is, I mean, there was a genuine controversy. And of course it went all the way up through the Court of Appeals in that way. And, uh, you know, things have changed obviously in this court. Um, so I guess my my response to you is I, I I think that there there arguably is still a controversy, uh, and of course Amiki have come in and and have advocated on the other side, but at the same time um, I think that you know and of course as you know we filed a motion for peremptory reversal given the the change in circumstances. I certainly don't know that this is the the proper case in which to get into these issues, um, you know in in terms of the at least in terms of the free exercise. Uh, provisions. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, the court 
the court has to do something with the Court of Appeals decision. I mean, we have a Court of Appeals decision that overturned the Court of Claims, which uh, entered a preliminary injunction, which determined the, uh, you know, the um, Section 152B to be unconstitutional as violative of uh, Article 8, Section 2. So I think that it's, it's, I, it's to me, inconceivable in, in for uh, there not to be something for the court to address at this stage. I mean, we have this, like I said, we have a Court of Appeals decision, which is published in it. Uh, it did overturn the, the Court of Claims decision. So however it turns out, if the Court of Claims decision is reinstated, um, then I think, you know, of course, we would be, we would be pleased with that. But I think the, sh the, sh the short answer is, yes, I think that there is a controversy here that, that needs to be addressed by, by the court. I think you mentioned that this isn't a case that's, that's ripe, or, or, or not perhaps ripe, but not the correct vehicle to take on a, a First Amendment uh, question because it, it really wasn't developed by the parties. But in the app order, I'm quite certain Justice Markman raised the issue in a concurring statement. And then we stayed this case pending resolution of Espinoza. Given that, why wouldn't we consider these issues? Well, with respect to, well, again, I, I guess I come back to the fact that, uh, you know, the issue wasn't litigated, but yes, it was raised. And I guess what I would say is, that the only extent to which the court needs to consider free exercise is to look at the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Espinoza, to look at its decision in, in Trinity Lutheran, and, and to appreciate the fact that here, uh, Article 8, Section 2 is not the same constitutional provision that the United States Supreme Court dealt with in those cases. What the free exercise issue was that Justice Markman raised was whether this provision operates in the manner that the constitutional provisions in those cases did. And my understanding was that was the issue that the court was interested in. And of course, we did brief that. Uh, the state briefed it. The amici briefed it. So I, I would agree that um, here, certainly the issue of uh, you know, whether the free exercise clause is implicated is something that uh, I think would be fine to, to address. But I guess my, my main issue is with respect to all of the, uh, the, the extrinsic evidence that Amiki tried to bring in, the attempt to try to challenge the subjective motivation of the voters that approved Article 8, Section 2. I think my point is on that, that is not something that is properly before the court because there was no record uh, developed on that. In addition to the fact that, as I said in, in, in responding to Justice Kavanaugh, this is, this is not the kind of case where subjective motivation is properly considered because of the uh, the, the voter referendum process that was followed here. Uh, there's, there's simply no way where, uh, you know, there were millions of voters that voted in favor of Proposal C, many of whom would presumably have voted because they supported public schools for, for the court to ever determine that, subject, that there was actually a, a discriminatory purpose behind it, um, I, I don't think is something that is, is appropriately considered in, in this particular case. Let's step into the hypothetical world. Okay. Uh, if if every non-public school was a religious school, would this constitutional amendment be a problem? If if so, if the only schools that were deprived of funding were religious schools, then I then I think in that situation you would fall within Trinity Lutheran and, and Espinoza because the court did make clear that if benefits are made generally available, they cannot be withheld solely on the basis of an entity's religious status. And in your view, would that change if 99% of the schools were religious schools and 1% were non-religious private schools? I, I think that would be definitely a different answer because then I think you're talking about disparate impact. And I think in that situation, the Supreme Court's precedents, and we, we you know, address them in our, our briefing, D disparate impact alone is not enough to find that there was discriminatory intent. There needs to be actual discriminatory purpose or discriminatory intent. So I think your example of the 99% would be a situation involving solely disparate impact. And so, no, I think in that situation, uh, we would not fall um, under Espinoza or Trinity Lutheran. All right, one final question. Can you help me understand your position? You, you indicated at the beginning of your comments this that, that Traverse City and advisory opinion really weren't about health, safety, and welfare. Um, if we read this statute as 
addressing self, self, health, safety, and welfare of people who attend non-public schools, as well as public schools, but non-public schools. Um, could we read, could we read uh, Traverse City and advisory opinion in a way that we wouldn't be required to reverse it and still uh, respect uh, Article 8 uh, constitutional amendment there? No, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any way to respect the constitutional text and not reverse here. I think that uh, it's important to, to keep in mind that when, uh, when Traverse City School District recognized a narrow exception for these auxiliary services that it recognized were health, safety, and welfare measures, what it was concerned about there was publicly funded services that were made generally available to all schools, public or non-public. And the concern there was that by withholding those services uh, solely from non-public schools, that there would be really the court was primarily focused on an equal protection concern. Um, but I don't think that by the discussion in Traverse City School District of uh, health, safety, and welfare measures, uh, when talking about auxiliary measures, I don't think that the court intended by that to say that, for example, here, um, you can provide direct public funding to non-public schools uh, simply by characterizing the funding as somehow being supportive of, of health, safety, and welfare. Um, I think that what Traverse City School District made clear is that if, if nothing else, what uh, Article 8, Section 2 precludes is direct funding of non-public schools uh, to, to assist in, in, in their operation. And that's precisely what the constitutional text provides. Thank you. Justice Viviano. Uh, no questions at the moment, thank you. Justice Bernstein. Yes, good afternoon. Could you tell me if you could, what effect would this have if the court were to render this to be unconstitutional? What would that effect be on public uh, for special education programs and services? Uh, well, in special education services in, of course, public schools are, are not at issue. If right, right, of course. We're talking about, sure. yeah. In non-public schools, yeah, of course. So I think that special education services, I think the devil's in the details there, Justice Bernstein. I think that what Traverse City School District made clear is that if there are services that are gonna be provided to both public school students and non-public school students, uh, there has to be control uh, over the services that are provided. So they have that you can't just provide money to non-public schools to provide those uh, special education services. So I think that here, if this, if this, if the, if this particular statute is struck down, there's nothing that prevents the legislature from going back to the drawing board and enacting a, a provision that would target something like. Uh, special education services in a way that make sure that control over those services rests with the public school authorities. Um, and I think the, the best way to do that, of course, is for uh, the special education services to be provided on public school grounds. But um, you know, I think the Traverse City School District recognized that even if services like that are provided um, on a, a non-public school grounds, that they're at least conceivably okay, so long as the, the, the control is there. But again, I think that the real, real difference is that if what the legislature is trying to do is provide funds directly to non-public schools, regardless of, of what the purpose is, I, I don't think that Traverse City School District authorizes that. And certainly the constitutional text does not. And I think at, at the end of the day, that's really where we have to return. Sure. So let me ask you a question and going into the transportation issue, and I just want to kind of get a sense of where you are on that as it pertains to what the state is on that, as it is relevant to special ed services and programs. So back when I used to practice law, one of my, one of my cases dealt with the issue of dual enrollment, which basically the court held that ultimately that a child who wanted to go to parochial schools to get a religious education who had a severe disability uh, that required physical therapy, occupational therapy, the, the litany of services that couldn't really be provided in the private school would still be provided by the residential school district. And the issue was that dual enrollment from that case was established to, to say that you could, you could have part of your day at the religious school, and then you would have the other part of your day at the public school and the public school, as you were saying, which is what this case kind of dealt with and, and created the, the, um, 
the, the understanding on would provide the more expensive services, the physical therapy, occupational therapy, the type of services that the private school wasn't able to do. Uh, but dealing with the transportation, the requirement would be that the child would have to go from the parochial school to the public school. If this gets struck down, what is your argument or your uh, approach as it pertains to transportation, which seems to be what the state is now kind of on board with, because the transportation basically would allow for a student in a parochial school to go to a public school and get transported back and forth. Could you comment on that in terms of sure. how this would impact that in terms of your position and the state's, well, I understand you're not representing the state, but I, I'm just curious if there is still a distinction between what you're arguing and what the state's arguing as it pertains to these special ed programs and services. Sure. Well, I think what the I think that the only difference, excuse me, really is that the state's position is that every all of the funding needs to be struck down, if you will, with the sole exception of uh, funding for transportation related costs. Because again, Article 8, Section 2 does carve out an exception for that. So I think where our difference is, is that here we have a multi-million dollar appropriation when you look at the, the course of years uh, when Section 152B was initially uh, enacted and then in subsequent years. Our position is that it's not possible for the court to know or certainly to determine, would the legislature have made a multi-million dollar appropriation to support transporting students to parochial schools and in your example for, for special education services. So our position is that because there's no way to know what the legislature would have done, it's not possible to sever that particular application and uphold the statute to the extent that it does that. We think that unfortunately the entire statute uh, needs to be struck down and then the legislature would need to go back and decide um, you know, does it want to make an appropriation for the purposes that you're talking about? And, and if so, how, what would that appropriation be? Okay, I, I promise I'm not going to drive you too much more crazy, but I really just want to understand the position on this. And, and this is being very helpful and very informative. So I'm just, it's, it's, I just, I'm just trying to really garner exactly kind of what the implications of this decision would be. So going back to the funding model that you would use, in, in most scenarios, basically the, the ISD is gonna provide the, um, the, the ISD will, will basically be in charge of the funding. So for example, if a student needs to have a parapro or a student needs to have certain services within the parochial school, those services are gonna come from the ISD, but they'd be managed by the ISD and thus would be would be basically given to the student when they are in the parochial school. You don't. I, I think I understand your answer. I just want to make clarification. You don't have any objection to that because that's that's a public school basically handling control over the resources. I th I think that I think that that's basically right. Certainly, striking down this statute would not have any effect on that situation. I think that would present a different question for a different case. But I right. I think that as long as it was done in a manner consistent with Traverse City School District, recognizing that to the extent that uh, a, a public, whether it's, a, it, let's say in, the, in this example, it is a public school teacher goes to a non-public school, including Correct. a parochial school. So right. long as the, the funding is controlled by the public authority, so long as it's a public employee, and so long as it doesn't a, a result in a situation where it's full-time employment at the non-public school, and so long as it, these are services that are provided across the board and are made generally available, that, then I, th I think you're right. I think that would be under Traverse City School District, uh, at, at least arguably okay. And, and certainly okay. outside the scope of this statute. And I have one last question just to kind of confirm all this. What about equipment? Um, what about if you're dealing with a brailler or a visual tech or just various equipment that would be used or that is necessary for special ed students to be able to use within a parochial school, would that be an issue as it pertains to if that, I guess if that if that comes through the ISD and then it's provided to the school, there wouldn't be an issue with that, correct? Well, I think that's a, I think that might, I think that might honestly be an issue because I, I think about advisory opinion um, and and the, the the issue of textbooks, and so I think the problem there would be. 
that those kinds of that devices, that kind of equipment that would be sort of a fundamental part of the educational process, I think would be um, probably akin to the, the textbooks. And I think that that would be, that would be aid that would be in support of or, or maintenance of, of the non-public school. So I think that might be a problem. So how would that be, okay. So how would that be addressed in this regard? You have a blind student that wants to go to a Catholic school and get a religious education. They, their, their residential, their residential school. I mean, the, the ISD would have to provide the, the, there's no, it's not possible for like a parochial school to put books in braille. It's just, that's, it's just, it's just, it's physically impossible. And, and it's also for all intents and purposes, it's just, it's, it's just a financial kind of in, in, in improbability. It just can't be done. So what would, what would happen in that regard? You have a student that basically, like I say, they, they'd like to get a parochial education. They'd like to get a Jewish education. They'd like to get a Catholic education. I apologize for taking up so much time, but I really do want to, I'm trying to learn from this as much as possible to understand. They want to get that education, but the equipment is going to have to come from the residential school district. Is it your position then? And again, I, I'm just trying to understand, right? Would it be your position then that the public school system or the residential district wouldn't be able to provide such equipment to that student if they want to go, if they're attending a parochial school? Justice Bernstein, I, I, think, I think that that, I, I, I keep coming back to really the, the problem with the, the plain text again of Article 8, Section 2 right. that we have to follow here, which is no, so no money uh, allocated or appropriated to non-public schools to right. aid or maintain them. And so right. here, similar to the textbooks, which I think the reason that the textbooks were provided in advisory opinion were because they were expensive, they were considered essential for right. the, the, the children who wanted to go to the, the parochial schools or the, you know, all non-public schools. But I think, again, the problem there is um, that is essential to the, the operation of the school. And so I think that's where we run into a problem. Okay, and I appreciate, and, and, and you've done a great job and I do appreciate you answering the questions. And again, it would, you would then just to confirm, you would then extend that to any type of, of accessible equipment or accessible technology or things of that nature that a, a special needs student would require. Uh, Your Honor, from my understanding of the, the text of the constitutional provision okay. and, and this court's guidance, I think the answer to that is yes. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. And thank you for answering all my questions. Thank you, Your Mr. Honor. Mr. DeRoja, I'm going to save your three minutes. Uh, okay. Mr. Mr. Restusha. Thank you. <clears throat> May it please the court, Eric Restusha from the Attorney General's Office, appearing on behalf of the governor and the superintendent of public instruction. I'd like to begin with a principle that really underlies the essential points of the case. The United States Supreme Court reaffirmed it in Espinoza, and that is a state need not subsidize private education, but once a state decides to do so, it cannot disqualify some private schools solely because they are religious. That applies here. There are three points I wanna make this afternoon that follow from and are related to this principle. The first is, it's clear that Michigan's constitution prohibits the direct payments of public money to the non-public schools to support their operation and maintenance with the exception of transportation costs. So for the statute at issue here, MCL 388-1752B, it's constitutional insofar as it allows for the reimbursement of transportation costs, but otherwise it violates Article 8, Section 2. That's the first point. The second point, is that Michigan's constitution does not violate the federal constitution, either as a matter of equal protection or free exercise in barring the direct payments for reimbursement of non-transportation state mandated costs to the non-public schools. Michigan law, Michigan's constitution does not distinguish between private secular and private religious schools. And that's a critical point. It was in Espinoza, and it's, had, it's a, an established principle even before Espinoza, it was articulated in Trinity Lutheran as well, when the court said, when this court has rejected free exercise challenges, the laws in question have been neutral and generally applicable without regard to religion, like Michigan's constitution. We have been careful to distinguish such laws from those that single out the religious for disfavored treatment. 
Michigan law doesn't disfavor elision. The department's policy, there was Missouri, expressly discriminates against otherwise eligible recipients by disqualifying, disqualifying them solely because of their religious character. Michigan Constitution does not do that. And the third point is that this court's decision in Traverse City confirms that only the transportation costs may be reimbursed. The opinion really has kind of two steps in its analysis, and it's kind of easy to run past the first step because the first step was looking at the direct payments of funding for $22 million for the lay instructors for the non-public schools. And the court used an economy of analysis. This was in part two of the opinion. It's almost like a single paragraph. Talked about the language of the amendment, the circumstances leading up to and surrounding its adoption. And it said that the act prohibits the purchase with public funds of educational services from a non-public school. It's kind of a straightforward analysis. Footnote two talks about the circumstances leading up to and surrounding its adoption. And in footnote two, it said the one thing that was clear in the electorate was no public monies to the private schools. And if you look at the second step in the analysis of the opinion, it's talking about services, not direct payments, services. So when you step back and that second step in the analysis, looking at services, a lot of it had to do with shared time and auxiliary services. And a lot of the standards we're talking about relate to those things. Those aren't direct payments as we have here. And then think about the predicate of the analysis of the court there as well. The court made clear that where a, a district makes available shared time and auxiliary services to the public school students, it was constitutionally required that it provide the same to the non-public school students. Well, this is a contrast here. There is no constitutional right of the non-public schools to have mandated costs reimbursed by the state. Think about private organizations throughout the state. We have a building code. We have public health code. We have public safety regulations. We sometimes change those and it, I'm sure it is, at times increases the cost of doing business for private organizations. It doesn't create a corresponding obligation for the state to reimburse private organizations the additional costs that will be incurred as a consequence of meeting these standards because there is no Headley Amendment for state mandates for private organizations. I'm, prepar I'm prepared for questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh. I don't have any questions. Justice Markman. No questions, thank you. Justice Sara. Well, I asked Mr. Restucia the same question I started with uh, Mr. DeRosier. Should I be concerned that we really don't have a genuine controversy here? It's well, you shouldn't be concerned. You have a court of appeals opinion that ruled. So consequently, you really have an opinion that needs to be addressed by the court. And it's a little different circumstance if there were no opinion below and, and uh, there was no adverse party to seek an appeal. That would be a different circumstance. But the court has jurisdiction over the case. You have an opinion below with analysis. You have an amici that are uh, advocating for the positions consistent with the court of appeals opinion. So I think the court has uh, a genuine controversy in its position to answer the questions that are before the court. Thanks. Um, employment division versus Smith. You might have studied it in law school, the peyote case. Yeah. Well, why isn't that in anyone's brief here? Isn't that um, isn't that instructive, if not uh, definitive, as it relates to uh, the law? The the law here that uh, um, seems to be having some infringement on First Amendment issues. Well, I, I, the, the peyote case, in my view, runs the, kind of the same track as Trinity Lutheran and Espinoza. It's cited expressly in, in uh, I believe, Trinity Lutheran, when it kind of runs through the three different cases. It goes through uh, kind of the general applic applicability and neutrality. And that's kind of the standard <clears throat> that peyote, the peyote case represents. And that's really the point I started with here is that as long as the law is of general applicability. The distinguishing factor from Michigan is against the Montana case uh, in Espinosa and Missouri is that both of those provisions expressly distinguish between private religious and private secular. And Michigan law doesn't do that. And that's one of the points that was made in Espinosa is you have no obligation to fund the private schools or to give, provide some kind of funding. But if you do, you have to do so in an even handed way. And Michigan Constitution is exactly of that character. It says no direct payments, and that's what Traverse City said, no direct payments to the non-public schools. 
Thank you. Justice Viviano. No questions. Uh, Justice Bernstein. Hey, it's always a pleasure to have you with us in the court. I always enjoy it when you come to argue. Thank you. Um, I, I'm just not going to take up too much of your time, but I do want to just get back into this issue with dual enrollment. Um, your your position, just to make sure I understand correctly, is that the transportation is 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 okay. It it doesn't violate any constitutional norms. So under that con under your argument, you uh, you wouldn't you would you would agree then? And just help me if I'm wrong. I just want to make sure I understand exactly the position for special needs kids or people with disabilities that want to have a parochial education. Under the transportation component there wouldn't be an objection to allowing for a student to spend part of the day at the public school where they would get the resources that they would need that only the public schools can provide because most of these resources cannot be provided by parochial schools. It's up to the residential school district to provide it because they're just incredibly expensive. They have braille books, they have things on tape, they have adaptive technology. They're just, the, the, the cost of educating students with special, special needs like myself is 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 almost it's just very high, and it requires government to do it in order to allow for you to be a participant in the process. So you have to go to public schools in order to have that. But under your model, there wouldn't be an issue or an objection or a problem with if somebody still wanted to have a religious education, maybe um, be able to go to a religious school for an hour or two to get the religious teaching, and then go back to the public school to get. The, the main structure of the education, under your understanding of this, the, the money would be available to then allow for transportation to be provided between the parochial and public school. That's right. For the transportation costs, those can be reimbursed. And, and I guess to address a little bit of the argument that was advanced by uh, the plaintiffs, I think that the statute is severable. It, you look through the whole point of Michigan law under 8.5 is to give constitutional applications. The legislature passed the statute. And I think the idea is the manifest intent that the legislature would want, I think, to give effect to those provisions, which for which there can be, it can be given effect. And for the transportation related costs, it can. I, this, this court should affirm the constitutionality of the statute insofar as it allows for the reimbursement of transportation costs. And that transportation could be used again for, for dual enrollment and such yep. things like that for. Yes. Thank you, that's all I have. Uh, Mr. Rustici, you have a considerable amount of time left. Are there other points you'd like to make? Nope, I, I don't have anything further. If, uh, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer additional questions, but if there are none, I'm more than happy to stand down. I'll open it up and see if anybody has additional questions given all the time left. Do, do, do any, of, uh, any of the justices have additional questions? I do. Okay. Um, Mr. Rustici, would you agree that the Church of Luke Kumi versus City Hylia case um, allows us to maybe peel back the facial neutrality of Article 8 and Section 2, uh, Article 8, Section 2 of our Constitution to assess whether this facially neutral language, in fact, violates the free exercise clause. I have three points in response. The first is uh, that the standard about the facial validity, you're right, that just because it has a facial validity isn't really the, that's not determinative by itself. And that's what uh, Lucchini uh, stands for. But the, the, kind of the standard is neutrality and general applicability. And if you think about the difference between Lucchini case and this case, it's helpful because here, it's not like Michigan's constitution tried to identify just the you know, private religious schools or even a denomination within all non-public schools. Whereas in Lucchini, the the statute was designed in such a way that it, it carved out, it didn't apply to other violent acts against animals. And then it took out a kosher uh, killing of animals. So it was left with only applying to essentially one community, one religious community. So in its character and application, it, had an un, it was unambiguous that it was targeting a single religious group. And I think also in looking at kind of the, the, the constitutional amendment itself, I think one of the questions you ask, and this was present in Trump versus Hawaii, and it was picked up from Romer, this idea that 
it would have to be inexplicable by any things other than than animus. And here, it's not hard to really figure out the, the, the reason for the actions of the electorate in 1970. And of course, the proposal H came in in 1978 and was defeated decisively. And then in 2000, proposal one came in and was also defeated, you know, as, as Mr. DeRozier mentioned by 69 to 31%. The idea that's motivating the electorate at, at these three different instances is an effort to protect the resources of the public schools. Now, I mean, there are different schools of thought on this and maybe it makes sense to provide some kind of um, direct payments to the, to the private schools. But that policy position was defeated in 1970 and then was again defeated in 1978 and in 2000. And so if you look at what the United States Supreme Court said in Espinosa is there's no obligation of the state to subsidize private education. And because there's no constitutional duty, Michigan and the electorates made the decision in 1970 that transportation costs, yes, but everything else, no direct payments. And that's how Traverse City reads. It really reads, talking about the direct payments, it's, you know, the language from Traverse City is, uh, the prohibitions of Proposal C are keyed into prohibiting the passage of public funds into private hands for purposes of running the private school operation. So. Thank you. Any additional questions for Mr. Restucia? Okay, Ms. Sherman. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court, Deputy Solicitor General Ann Sherman here on behalf of Amicus Attorney General Dana Nessel in support of plaintiff's appellants. There are three steps to the analysis here. And if the analysis is taken in its proper sequence, it addresses federal constitutional concerns, it appropriately focuses on the language of Article 8, Section 2, and it integrates Traverse City's analysis, which has to be done here. Applying those steps sequentially demonstrates a serious flaw in the Court of Appeals majority opinion. Section 152B is unconstitutional. As to all but probably the transportation mandates and the Attorney General would agree that even if constitutional, those could not stand where the rest of the mandates are severed. The first step has to be looking at whether there's a free exercise violation or uh, an equal protection clause violation. And that's because of the supremacy clause in recent US Supreme Court case law. But here, because both Article 8, Section 2 and 152B are even handed, they apply to all non-public schools. They really, as has been discussed already, they differ markedly in kind from the Missouri provision in Trinity Lutheran from the Montana provision in Espinosa, and from cases that are cited by other amici. So this court can move on to whether 152B violates Article 8, Section 2. And Traverse City is very helpful in understanding what Article 8, Section 2 prohibits, but particularly what it means to aid and maintain a, pub, a non-public school. Traverse City outlines were essentially two layers of analysis, and I would agree with Mr. Restucia on that point. Uh, and they have to be taken sequentially. That first layer is whether funds are paid directly to the non-public school and you're giving the non-public school control. It's impossible to correctly read Traverse City without engaging in that layer of analysis first before you turn to the second layer, which talks about instructional versus non-instructional, primary versus incidental. So if, as is true here, you have funds that are paid directly to the school, to the non-public school, you give the non-public school control over those funds, the analysis is done. The funding is unconstitutional and you don't even get to what I would consider to be like a step three of the analysis. And that's where I think the Court of Appeals erred in starting its analysis with this step three, this instructional versus non-instructional and this primary incidental. It, doing that wrongly allowed them to create this blanket protection for every single health, welfare and safety provision even when you have mandates like the ones that are issued here that are markedly different from general government services like police, fire, nursing, counseling, or special education uh, that is supported by federal funds. And so it, that taking those out of sequence really left the Court of Appeals majority having to then double back 
to the direct payment and control language in Traverse City and trying to somehow rationalize why these mandate reimbursements don't really amount to helping non-public schools stay in business or pay salaries. And they clearly do both. It's telling when a Court of Appeals majority opinion says, were we to uh, were we restricted to solely examining the constitutional language absent other considerations and on a clean slate, we might very well agree with our colleague's position. That that's the partial dissent. I would agree to the extent that we have to look at federal constitutional concerns. Those are a must. And that's why I said, I think the analysis has to start there. And especially after Trinity Lutheran, Lutheran and Espinosa, we have to begin there. But this court's decision in Traverse City cannot be read, absent federal constitutional concerns, it can't be read as not being able to be examined and contemplated in light of the plain language of Article 8, Section 2. And again, I think that that position of the Court of Appeals, however well-meaning it was, came from not handling this uh, the, sequentially what the what the analysis had to be. Um, this court should reverse the Court of Appeals decision and hold that uh, Section 152B cannot stand. I do wanna take a quick a few seconds and address some of the questions that have been asked. Uh, Justice Zara, you asked whether there was I mean, a- Ms. Sherman, wait, you're, you are out of time. Let me okay. just ask if any of my colleagues have questions for you, okay. okay? Does anybody have a question for Ms. Sherman? I think Justice Zara now wants to hear what you were going to say in response. So why don't you why don't you why don't you finish that and then we'll move I, on. I do, but I was afraid I would be usurping uh, Justice <laughs> Bernstein's uh, standard. I'll be no. I'll be quick, Your Honor. I did want to address your question about whether there's a live controversy here, and it isn't just about the existence of court of appeals opinion. We have plaintiffs' appellants who are arguing that the statute, is, in its entirety, should be struck down. We have. Def we have uh, defendants, appellees, who are saying that the statute is constitutional, but needs to be narrowed, that some parts of it need to be severed. That is a live controversy, um, and it, it is susceptible to this court's review. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Sherman. Mr. Wolf. Please the court. I am Len Wolf, appearing on behalf of the Michigan Catholic Conference and the Michigan Association of Non-Public Schools. I'll be using my allotted time to argue that mandate grants are constitutional under our Blaine Amendment, while Mr. Birch will be using his time to address the constitutionality of our Blaine Amendment under Masterpiece Cake Shop, Trinity Lutheran, and the Espinosa cases. The 2012 mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School and the 2013 MLive Media Group's investigation exposing numerous safety violations at Michigan schools acted as catalysts for the state's enactment of various health safety and welfare measures, including the mandates grants for non-public schools that are at issue in this case. For almost 100 years, the state of Michigan has regulated and overseen the health safety and welfare requirements for non-public schools. Under our system, the state has the power to impose health, safety, and welfare measures to ensure that all children attend schools that are clean, healthy, and safe. Now, in the middle of a global pandemic, despite the fact that schools are incurring significant costs to navigate the dangers of in-person learning with COVID-19, the parties and the Attorney General request that the court interpret our Blaine Amendment to prevent the state from providing any direct funding to non-public schools including public funds for public health, safety, and welfare concerns. Their interpretation would prohibit the state from appropriating funds to non-public schools to prevent school shootings or to make buildings more secure, or as applied in today's pandemic world, prevent the state from appropriating funds for non-public schools for mask, cleaning supplies, and COVID testing. In addition, the parties rewrite the court's longstanding precedent by extending its application to bar any direct funding of non-public schools, which would cause major harm to the education of over 100,000 non-public school students, isolate non-public schools from the rest of our K-12 education system, and more importantly, adversely impact their health, safety, and welfare. Mandate grants are not blame type appropriations, and they do not 
violate our Blaine Amendment. Our Blaine Amendment does not prohibit all appropriations to non-public schools, but only appropriations that are directly or indirectly to aid or maintain any non-public school. Mandate grants are not funds that aid or maintain any non-public school. Instead, the mandate grants at issue here are funds limited to reimbursing a small portion of the cost of the uh, already paid by non-public schools for the health, safety, and welfare requirements. Unlike for public schools, the state has no obligation to pay for health, safety, and welfare mandates imposed on non-public schools. However, when the state desires to promote certain health, safety, and welfare measures and appropriates funds to entice compliance, there's nothing in the Blaine Amendment that prohibits direct payments to non-public schools to carry out these purposes. As commonly understood at the time of the Blaine Amendment's passage, the circumstances leading up to the 1970 election, and has analyzed this court in two prior cases, the Traverse City case and NRA constitutionality of PA 242 of 1974, this court recognized that the Blaine Amendment prohibits appropriations for three broad categories, tuition, teaching, and textbooks. Tuition, meaning support uh, or personal tax exemptions for parents attending non-public schools, teaching, meaning paying or reimbursing a non-public school for non-lay teachers performing secular education services, and textbooks, meaning paying or reimbursing a non-public school for books and school supplies, costs this, this court deemed Blaine type appropriations because they are an essential or primary function for operating and maintaining a non-public school. In this case, the Court of Appeals majority held that the state may pay mandate grants to non-public schools if the funds are non-instructional in nature, are not a primary function or element necessary for a non-public school to exist, operate, and survive, and they do not involve or uh, is uh, in excessive religious entanglement. While the Court of Appeals specifically identified three of the 46 mandates uh, as meeting the standard, it's, it is clear that all of the fundates, uh, funding mandates meet the Court of Appeals standard and are not prohibited by our Blaine Amendment. Mandate grants are not Blaine type appropriations because they are not used for tuition support. They're not used to pay or reimburse a non-public school for teaching or educational services. And they're not used for educational materials that are primary and essential to a non-public school's existence. Instead, mandate grants are the state's decision to reimburse non-public schools for the cost of compliance with 46 health, safety and welfare mandate requirements that are non-instructional in scope, do not reimburse a non-public school's employees have only an incidental impact on that non-public school's operations and are paid through a program controlled entirely by the state. The parties in this case and the Attorney General argument that, uh, argue that the amendment bars the payment of any funds for non-public schools. However, this court's precedent has never interpreted the amendment this way. The parties in the Attorney General's position undermines our Blaine Amendment. It limits the authority of the state to oversee non-public schools and it excludes non-public schools from the state's education system. The court in Traverse City determined it could not interpret the Blaine Amendment to absolutely bar any funds for non-public schools because it, in part to do so would violate the free exercise clause. And without the Traverse City decision, the court would have to engage in a full uh, free exercise clause analysis to determine not just whether the grants violate the Blaine Amendment but whether the amendment violates the free exercise clause. Instead, the Traverse City Court utilized an alternative constitutional construction, which preserved the amendment's prohibition against Blaine type appropriations that are consistent with the common understanding and the circumstances leading to the passage of the amendment. This court has never applied a strict no benefits rule for non-public schools and doing so now as proposed by the parties in the attorney general would be contrary to Traverse City. The state's mandate program as examined using the Traverse City factors shows that the mandates are allowed by the amendment because first, mandate grants do not aid or maintain non-public schools. Mandate grants do not, uh, do not fall within the definition of a Blaine type appropriation because they are for health, safety and welfare purposes, non-instructional purposes. And to the extent they provide any economic benefit, it's only an incidental benefit that has a minimal impact on an otherwise viable non-public school. All non-public schools survive without the funding and the funds have no impact on a school's budget. Second, mandate grants do not support the attendance of any student at a non-public school. Mandate grants do not fund educational services for non-public schools. And none of these grants are for tuition, textbooks, or school supplies. To the extent the, the funds have an economic benefit, it's an incidental benefit. 
And third, mandate grants don't employ any person at a non-public school. Traverse City prohibited the payment of non-public school teachers for teaching secular courses to non-public schools at non, uh, students at non-public schools. Here, the mandate grants provide reimbursement for a portion of the time that a non-public school employee tasked with completing uh, and complying with a government health and general welfare activity uh, spends. Um, these aren't mandates for non-public schools. Uh, these, are, these mandates are, non, are non-instructional and they are similar to other public services that fall outside the amendments uh, employment for educational purposes. And fourth, this mandate grant program is entirely under the state's control. Every aspect and decision of this program is under the state supervision. The forms design, which mandates are included or not included, whether a form that's submitted is complete, the amount of funds that can be distributed to a non-public school, the calculation of the non-public school's actual costs, proration of the grants, and review of the non-public school records uh, to verify whether or not um, it's an actual cost. The only decision that's under the non-public school's control is whether they submit a form for reimbursement. It's a voluntary program. So the state in enacting the mandate program is carrying out a public purpose that encourages non-public schools to adhere to health, safety, and welfare mandates that protect teachers and children attending schools. State funding for this public purpose is not Blaine type appropriations and is not prohibited. And finally, uh, let me point out that there's recent state grant programs, just like the mandate grant programs that provide direct benefits to non-public schools, teachers and non-public uh, st students. For example, the $25 million safety grant administered by the Michigan Department of State Police to fund public and non-public schools plans in 2015, 2018, and 2019. Similar to mandate grants, these grants are not blame type appropriations as commonly understood by the voters when the amendment was adopted. We respectfully request that you affirm the Court of Appeals decision in this case and vacate the Court of Appeals decision order remanding the case for further proceedings. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Are there any questions from any of the justices for Mr. Wolf? Okay, Mr. Birch. There we go. Good afternoon, Your Honors. John Bursch on behalf of Amiki, Immaculate Heart of Mary, and uh, First Liberty. May it please the court. Plaintiffs, the defendants, and now even the Attorney General seek to invalidate an appropriation designed to promote the health and safety of more than 100,000 Michigan children, to protect students from asbestos and mercury, unsafe playgrounds, and child predators, and others with criminal backgrounds. The plaintiffs say they're merely safeguarding public funding for public schools, but they specifically target religious schools. In fact, that reality is codified on the first page of every pleading filed in this case, which highlights the lead plaintiff's corporate name, Council Against Parochiate, which we all understand to be aid to church schools, not private schools generally, not secular schools, but to church schools. Um, what's more, Article 8, Section 2, Michigan's Blaine Amendment, violates the federal constitution's free exercise clause in three ways. Um, first, as has been discussed, the Blaine Amendment was enacted against a backdrop where 98% of private school students attended church-related schools. So despite the use of clever language, this is a religious gerrymander, exactly the way that Lacoumi described it. Um, now, I thought it was interesting that when Justice Zara asked Mr. DeRozier about that, he said, I would agree if it was 100%, this would be unconstitutional under Trinity Lutheran and Espinoza. But if it's 99 or 98%, well, then that's, that's okay. Well, if you considered a Jim Crow era law that gave public funding only to students who sat in the front of public buses, the fact that because of a few remote areas in the South, 2% of African-American students could sit in the front of the buses, no one would dispute that that was passed intentionally to discriminate based on race. There's no question about that. And here, it's exactly the same. Um, and, and it's not a matter of discerning disparate impact, uh, which would be the Smith test. Um, under Lakumi and under Masterpiece Cake Shop, it's the intent. And clearly the intent was to discriminate against religious schools specifically. I'm gonna come back to that. 
Um, the second reason is that the Blaine Amendment forces religious organizations to what uh, Trinity Lutheran describes as an untenable choice. They can either be churches or they can be eligible for public funding. And in Michigan, if you were a private secular school, you could jump through the hoops and seek status as a charter school and you would be eligible for public funding. It is only Michigan's religious schools which are excluded from that process and excluded again under the Blaine Amendment. That's the second reason and we'll rely on our brief for that. Um, the third is that under Lakumi and Masterpiece Cake Shop, even slight suspicion of religious animus is enough to invalidate a facially neutral, generally applicable action. And, and that's where I want to focus. Um, and, and first, what the, the justices, six of them in Masterpiece Cake Shop instruct, is that cards like this one have to consider three things, historical background, events leading up to the enactment, and then finally, the legislative history, including contemporaneous statements made by members of the decision-making body. Uh, so again, the, the Supreme Court has directed you to consider that type of evidence. This isn't something that's somehow unlawful for you to consider. Um, what's the historical background? Well, we've discussed that. 98% of students were in private religious schools at the time that uh, Proposal C was passed. Um, that, that's overwhelmingly evidence that this was targeted at religious schools. How about the events leading up to the enactment? You don't need to have a trial on this. Go read footnote two of the Traverse City opinion. It goes on at length about how everyone considered this to be an attempt to stop parochiate. Uh, the court's words were, as far as the voter was concerned, Proposal C was an anti-parochiate amendment. No public monies to run to public or parochial schools. Well, again, what are parochial schools? They are religious schools. They are sectarian schools. That is substantial evidence of intent. That's even before you get to the contemporary statements of decision makers, which we lay out on pages 10 through 12 of uh, our Mickey brief. You put all that together. And again, the standard isn't proof that there was discriminatory intent against religious schools or even a preponderance of evidence. The standard under Masterpiece Cake Shop was, is there slight suspicion? And the answer to that, in light of all the historical evidence in this court statements in Traverse City, it has to be yes. Um, so just very briefly, a couple points that I wanna hit. Um, one, in response to questions, um, there was a, a, a dispute over whether just the facial language was enough. And Lakumi and Trinity Lutheran, Espinoza and Masterpiece all point the exact opposite way. Um, this court is not only entitled to, you're obligated to look past neutral language of general applicability and neutrality and determine whether there's a slight suspicion of discriminatory animus. Um, is there a need for a hearing? No, absolutely not. Uh, in light of all of the contemporary evidence, the historical background, the events leading to enactment and those statements, that's enough. Um, what's more, you can look at the text yourself. Um, in Lakumi, uh, the court pointed to the word sacrifice and ritual as signals that the legislature there, or the, the local government body, was targeting this particular religious sect because they were the only ones involved in those things. Here, our textual clue is that the Blaine Amendment includes the word denominational. You wouldn't need that word if this was simply a matter of going after all private schools. But even in the text itself, the electorate and those who supported Proposal C were directing their animus at religious schools. Um, and then finally, uh, with respect to Justice Bernstein's questions, um, I, I think we should take those very seriously about um, special ed education services and payments. Uh, to be perfectly clear, based on the brief that they submitted, the plaintiffs and the governor and the attorney general in this case would all take the position that special ed services being provided on site at a private school but paid for with federal funding would be unlawful under their broad interpretation of the amendment. That's because federal monies flowing to an intermediate school district would be public monies paid to a private school. Pl plain and simple, all of those have to go, except possibly transportation, that the governor and the superintendent of public education make an exception for that. Um, it, it's impossible to, to believe that the people of Michigan would have thought that Braille books, things like Brailler equipment, parapros and things like that, all used on site at a private Catholic school or any religious school would somehow be prohibited. Um, now there's two ways that you can get out of this mess. Um, and, and I would point you to Moses versus Ruskowski for the first way. That's the New Mexico Supreme Court case discussed in the MCC and Mann's brief at pages 24 to 27. No one's discussed it today. That also involved a neutral Blaine Amendment, just like Michigan. But for all the reasons that I've articulated today, the court in New Mexico, the Supreme Court concluded that it was motivated or tainted by anti-Catholic animus. Now there, they did not strike down the Blaine Amendment. They simply used it as an interpretive tool to interpret the statute narrowly in a way that allowed the funding in that particular situation to flow. That's one option. 
The other option, of course, is just to strike down the Blaine Amendment in its entirety, and that's what we're urging you to do. But sticking with the, the approach in New Mexico, um, I want to highlight the words um, because Mr. Wolf mentioned these, but none of the government attorneys or the plaintiffs did. Um, the, the statute, the Blaine Amendment, I'm sorry, the provision does not say no public monies can be paid to private schools. It says no public monies can be appropriated or paid to aid or maintain. Now, if you're properly construing those words narrowly, as the free exercise clause would force you to do here to avoid potential constitutional problems, aid or maintain has to have meaning. It narrows this in some way. What does it not include? The concept of reimbursement. So when you're talking about reimbursing for state mandates, whether it's testing for lead in Flint for those poor school kids, whether it's masks and COVID testing as being proposed right now, or protecting kids with criminal background checks has been um, uh, proposed in 152B, none of those are aiding or maintaining a school. They are simply reimbursing for mandates. Uh, and that, that same narrow interpretation of the words aid or maintain, giving them their literal meaning uh, and not creating free exercise problems would also cure the problem with the special education funding. Because when special education funding is coming to an intermediate school district and being distributed, that is not aid or maintenance for the local school. It is simply a transfer from a federal government entity for the purposes of providing special education services for students. Um, so at a, a bare minimum, you should use these free exercise principles and everything said in the U.S. Supreme Court's jurisprudence about them to construe this narrowly, just like the New Mexico Supreme Court did. That would allow 152B to, uh, to stand in its entirety. But if you disagree with that, then you do have to do the more searching inquiry. And under that, I think the only conclusion under a slight suspicion of animus standard is that the statute or the, the Blaine Amendment is unconstitutional. I'm happy to take the court's questions. Are there questions for Mr. Gersh? I, I have a question. So can you help me understand or, or what would be the, the proper way to look at when you're, when you're uh, suggesting that we look at the contemporaneous statements of the decision-making body? It's, it's relatively easy to see that in the leukemia case, right? Where you have a, you have a, a locality and, and the reasons why that was passed. But here, you know, you have, you have a, a, initi a ballot initiative or something that was voted on by the entire state of Michigan, um, are, do you have to, do, would we have to attribute a discriminatory intent to the voters, a majority of the voters, a portion of the voters, any of the voters, even if the proponents of the amendment, like let's assume that that is, they were motivated by discriminatory intent. What do we do with the fact about passage by the voters? Justice Kavanaugh, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case answers that question for you, because the standard isn't whether all the voters or a majority of the voters thought this, whether there's an, even a slight suspicion that there was animus. And you can look at some statements of the voters. We put those in our Mickey briefs. You can look at what the Council Against Parochiate said publicly in support of it. I mean, that's over all over a number of briefs. Um, you can look at the, the religious gerrymand, which applied this rule to um, a, a class that included 98% uh, students attending religious schools. Um, but I urge you to go back and look at that footnote too in the Traverse City case, because there the court lays it all out, that the public understood that this was anti-parochiate, anti-religious schools. Um, th th this was the Michigan Supreme Court's words. Everyone agreed the proposed amendment was designed to halt parochiate and would have that effect if adopted. As far as the voter was concerned, Proposal C was an anti-parochiate amendment no public monies to run the parochial schools. I mean, based on that alone, which of course is, is precedent that binds this court, I think you can conclude that there was a slight suspicion and that's the standard. Okay, and then my other question regarding your, the aid to maintain, and I think this was, was also um, relevant to Mr. Wolf's argument there, I think he, he mentioned the 42 mandates um, that, that the statute relates to. Does that require, and that that, can't be to aid or maintain. Do we have to, does, does the state have to determine on a case-by-case -case basis whether or not uh, compliance with that uh, or reimbursement, as you say, really does start to become aid and maintain? What if it's, what if they could, you know, they could comply or their tuition or their other fundraising efforts cover their compliance with five of them, but they couldn't comply with all 42? without, they couldn't, they couldn't keep their doors open without being able to do that. I mean, I think, uh, how do you, how does that not 
I mean, it's certainly factually, there could be a situation where the private schools inability to comply with the mandates could jeopardize their ability to keep their doors open to maintain their private school. Um, is that, and, and perhaps not, I mean, they could always charge enough tuition and fundraise that they don't need to. And it's just bonus money that they're getting for complying with these state mandates. Um, does that require then it's, it's gotta be on a case by case basis, a school by school basis, a budget year by budget year basis. Uh, no, because you're not looking at it from the perspective of the school. You're looking at it from the perspective of the state. And what's important to remember is that these are mandates. So, for example, it would not be best practice, but a school could certainly operate with asbestos in the ceiling or not having criminal background checks or without providing any transportation. But the state, once it requires those things, that's not aiding or maintaining the school being open. It could be open without those things. It's now requiring something in addition. And when the state appropriates monies to allow the schools to pay for the mandates that the state alone has imposed, not minimum things required to keep the doors open like teachers and textbooks as Mr. Wolf was talking about, but things that the state is requiring them to do above and beyond that, then it's no longer aid or maintenance, it's reimbursement. And if well, the voters have wanted- What about point that they can keep their doors open if they don't maintain uh, the ability to do, uh, make sure that their teachers are not you know, that, that they have qualified teachers to teach, which requires compliance with the state mandate. So they literally can't keep their doors open without complying well, with that mandate, right? For private religious schools, their teachers don't always satisfy all of the requirements that the state mandates for public school teachers. They don't have to be certified in the same way. They don't necessarily have to have an education degree. Uh, Catholic schools, for example, will take from programs like the University of Notre Dame's, where they have undergraduate students who do not have education degrees, but allow them to teach. In a public school, you could never do that. Um, so, I mean, hypothetically, maybe but you're talking isn't about- Isn't the question whether they can do that with respect to these particular mandates? Can Correct. they keep their doors open by not complying with those mandates? Um, as I look at the list of mandates, and we put them all in our brief, I think a school could stay open without complying with any of those. Now, of course, they want to do that because these are the type of the things that keep kids safe. Um, but, but it makes it an easy line to say that 152B doesn't run afoul of the Blaine Amendment, especially if you're construing that language narrowly as the free exercise clause would require. Okay. Thank you. Are there additional questions for Mr. Birch? Yes, Mr. I have a question. Oh, uh, you go first, Brian. Okay, thanks, Richard. Um, as I understand it, you're making, you're, you're presenting two arguments. One, that the... Um, Article 8, Section 2 violates the free exercise clause and has to be struck down. Or alternatively, let's look at the statute. The statute only precludes aid or maintain. And when it's a mandatory grant, a mandate, I'm sorry, a, a mandate that funding to cover a mandate imposed by the school is not to aid or maintain the school. And that would be under Traverse City, correct? I would call that a reimbursement. Now, Mr. Wolf has you know, much more elegantly than I could explained all the other reasons why this funding is good under Traverse City. My, my narrow point is that if you're considering the overlay of the free exercise problems, we need to construe that phrase, aid or maintain, narrowly in its context. to And, and, like and in that way, I got it. In that way, the statute wouldn't be unconstitutional. The, the state constitutional provision wouldn't run afoul of the First Amendment and Traverse City would not be overruled. Correct, it, it would solve a lot of problems. So wouldn't we have to go through uh, clause by clause? I'm not saying we couldn't do this, but is every clause and every, um, every bit of funding under this statute um, really aid or maintain? Or are there some things that run afoul? Um, well, as I was just discussing with Justice Kavanaugh, as I read those provisions, I can't single out one that would be more in the, the nature of an aid or maintain as opposed to reimbursement for a state mandate. What now, about career appeals, counseling? What's that? Career counseling. Career counseling? A per perfect example. Career counseling is not something that a school needs to keep its doors open. But if the state chooses to impose that standard as a condition of having your school, and then they appropriate some money to reimburse for that, that that's a pure reimbursement. That's not an aid or maintain. Thank you. Justice Bernstein? Yeah, just, I just have a question on this um, 
if a student, let's say, is enrolled in dual enrollment, meaning that they get their, they, they get, they basically get their public school education, but they also get their religious school education. And the, and the, in the ISD provides them a computer. So let's say it's a student that has uh, certain special needs and they're given a computer by the ISD for their use in public schools, which is pretty common. Would they have to leave that computer in the public school if they were going on to a Catholic school for their religious education. So they're in the public school using the ISD technology that's provided to them, but then they leave that school to go to get Catholic education for a certain part of the day. Would they then not be pre permitted to take the computer from the, from the public school provided to them by the ISD to the Catholic school? Um, the way I read the plaintiff's briefs, the defendant's briefs, and the attorney general's brief, the answer to that would be no, they could not take the laptop. Because if the ISD bought equipment and it was then used on site at the Catholic school, that would be payment or appropriation of monies that go to the private school. Under our interpretation, that would be okay, because that would not be aiding or maintaining the private school. It would simply be aiding or maintaining the student with disabilities. I see. Thank you. Any additional questions for Mr. Birch? Thank you, Mr. Birch. And in conclusion, uh, Madam Chief Justice, I, I would just say, let lay Masterpiece Cake Shop and Footnote 2 from Traverse City side by side. Um, and I think this is a, a very easy case. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. DeRozier, you have three minutes and six seconds. Thank you, Chief Justice McCormick. Well, I'm going to start where Mr. Burst just left off. I think that if you look at, and this is all discussed in detail in our reply to the amici, if you look at, let's just start with uh, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. There you had a decision of an adjudicatory body that was made. And in that case, in that very limited situation, the court looked at statements of decision makers. That is a decision making body. The court went out of its way to point out that that is a totally different situation than what we have, for example, here. As I said, and again, this is discussed in our, in our reply to the amici, when you have a state constitutional provision that is enacted by voter referendum with millions of people voting, the test, there is no precedent, there is no authority that that can be uh, undone by or, or even examined in terms of a, a slight suspicion of animus. But we cited in our, in our brief, uh, a Sixth Circuit case, uh, Clark versus City of Cincinnati, that makes the point that uh, this, there's no Supreme Court precedent that ever looked at the subjective motivations of voters in that situation, unless, as Mr. Restusham mentioned, unless it was a situation where the only explanation for the referendum was animus. And I think that there is, uh, as we've said, I mean, the, the, this, particular provision on its face, it does not distinguish between non-public schools and religious schools. That all non-public schools uh, are prohibited from uh, receiving aid or maintenance from the state. And so I, I would just uh, completely disagree uh, with the idea that this court is somehow mandated to look at subjective motivation. I think if you look at the cases, you'll see that this case is completely different than Masterpiece. And then let's talk about Lukumi, which Justice Kavanaugh also referenced. There, the court, the, the majority of the court in Lukumi did not, and we discussed this in our brief as well, the court did not, a majority, accept the idea that you look at subjective motivation. The court in Lukumi, the majority, looked at the plain text and looked at how it applied. And again, as it was applied, and as Mr. Sushi again pointed out, the problem with the ordinance in that case was that as applied, it only, it only applied to the Santorini uh, religion's practice of slaughter. Any other form of slaughter was fine. And so that is a completely different situation than what we have here. So I think that this idea that the, the court is bound, let alone should even be guided by Lukumi, and uh, master key, Masterpiece Cake Shop, I, I just, I think that that's um, incorrect. Uh, with respect to the Mr. Moses De case- Mr. from DeRocher. Yes, Justice Markham. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I can't remember the name of the, the decision, 
But wasn't there a decision in the 1970s issued by the United States Supreme Court that struck down, I think was called the Rumford Amendment at the time, which had to do with um, fair housing. It was an enactment by referendum or initiative of the state of California, and it enacted a, 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 a housing ordinance that was contrary to the previous fair housing policy that had existed at the time. The court struck that down on the basis of it uh, reflecting animus on the part of the electorate of the state of California at the time. Does that case ring a bell with you at all? You know, I, I'm wondering if you're thinking of the Arlington Heights case. No, I'm not thinking no, of the Arlington Heights that case, no. Um, well, that had to do with them. Um, um, that had to do with the necessity of intentional discrimination in the, um, in the equal protection context, but that's a distinctive case. It was the United States Supreme Court case. Okay, well, I, I'm sorry, Your Honor, that, that one is not um, coming to mind at the moment, but, I, but what I will, I think, go back to where I feel, I feel comfortable in saying that if the court does go back and look at those cases, you are not going to find a situation where uh, a, a, a referendum enacted law was, um, was invalidated on the basis of looking at, at extrinsic evidence of subjective motivation. No, I believe that's I, exactly what happened in the case I'm trying to identify here, but I can't, I can't share the name, but uh, well, we'll all have a chance to look at it if we have the inclination afterwards, but that's precisely what I thought had happened in this case. Yeah, and I, well, Your Honor, I did, I, I don't recall seeing, um, in that case, like I said, it's not coming to mind, but I don't recall seeing a case like ours, and certainly there has been no authority cited by Amiki to do the kind of exacting examination that's being suggested here. I think that the, that the case law, the Supreme Court's precedents are, are clear that in order to look at discriminatory purpose, you have to have it such that there's no other explanation for why what was done was done. And I don't think that that can be said here. Um, I also wanted to return um, just real quickly to this idea of uh, the difference between uh, aid or maintain and reimbursement. Um, you know, aid or maintain, if you look at the definition, the aid is to give assistance, maintain is to support or provide for. I don't see how you can have mandates imposed by the legislature that have to be complied with in order for a non-public school to operate. Uh, and then the, the, the state uh, appropriates funds to be paid to the non-public school to help it meet those mandates, which I think Justice Kavanaugh touched on this, have to be met in order for the school to operate. I don't understand how that doesn't fit within the plain and ordinary meanings of, of, of aid or maintain. Um, so that was really uh, the, other, uh, the other thing I wanted to touch on in, in, in addition to the free exercise point. Thank you, Mr. DeRozier. Thank you, everybody else. Uh, the case Thank will you. be submitted and that concludes our case call for today. Thank you. Thank you.